Um, and here is the technical message. So uh, this is for all of you to know that the conference will be recorded. Um, there will be simultaneous interpretation throughout the whole conference in English and Ukrainian. You can enable the interpretation by clicking on the globe icon and choosing your language. You're, if you are connected on the mobile phone device, you can also click on the three dots on the right hand side and choose the tab language in, interpretation and then select your preferred language. And if you prefer to listen to interpretation only, you can mute the original audio. Доброго ранку, шановні учасники конференції. Um, почну з деякої uh, технічної інформації. Протягом усієї конференції організований синхронний переклад uh, з англійською та українською. Uh, ви можете увімкнути переклад, натиснувши на глобус та обравши українську або англійську. Якщо ви підключилися з, могіль, з мобільного пристрою, будь ласка, натисніть на, тикра, на три крапочки розташовані знизу праворуч і виберіть вкладку «Переклад» та оберіть українську або англійську. Якщо ви хочете слухати е, лише переклад, ви можете вимкнути оригінальний звук. I guess now everybody is connected. Super. So, um, I would like to invite everybody um, to open this conference with a minute of silence and memory of all victims of Russian war in Ukraine since 2014, uh, victims of terror and violence, as well as those brave men and women who sacrificed their lives and on the battlefield and will always be remembered. Please join in. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, now, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the conference, The Environmental Consequences of Russian War in Ukraine, together for future recovery of Ukrainian environment. The conference is organized and brought to you by Clean Air for Ukraine with financial support uh, from the Transition Promotion Program of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. A little more than a year since the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia, we gather here today to zoom in um, on one of the lesser talked about consequences of the war, the environmental one. Since February 2022, the State Environmental Inspectorate of Ukraine has documented more than 2,300 environmental crimes. To illustrate the magnitude, I'd like to provide you with one example. Total area of forests already liberated and requiring decontamination is 2.4 million hectares. This is equivalent of 80% of the size of Belgium. Our speakers today will present the main sources of environmental pollution during military activities, their impact on the air, water, land, natural ecosystems and human settlements in general. We will also discuss the mechanisms for monitoring and recording the damages caused, as well as the legal ways to claim reparations. They will also cover the challenges that are abating Ukraine in its rebuilding and recovery after the victory. To facilitate the Q&A session, we will conclude this which will conclude this conference, we will invite the participants to write their questions in the chat section. Um, and it, in case you'd like to address one particular speaker, you can mention their name starting with an ad symbol. Some questions will be answered directly in written in chat and some will be answered during the Q&A session. Um, questions can be formulated both in Ukrainian and in English. 
So without, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first keynote speaker, um, Jakub Lewandowski from the Embassy of the Czech Republic of Ukraine, to, uh, from the Embassy of the Czech Republic to Ukraine. Sorry. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Firstly, um, I would like to thank you for, uh, for the invitation to uh, today's uh, very interesting event. And it's a great honor to me to participate in the opening of that. Um, uh, we, at the moment, we are experiencing the greatest war of uh, the 21st century. And uh, Ukraine, uh, like its foreign friends, uh, can, can shoot and is thinking about the future. Uh, <clears throat> moreover, we want, to be, uh, we want this future to be safe, not only in the military or political sense, but also you know, for the environment. Uh, that, um, that is we are responsible for following the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the European Green Deal. Uh, in times of the war, um, uh, survival values and military necessity often prevail in its nature, often prevail over the environmental issues. Uh, for example, last winter, Ukrainians had to use uh, diesel generators uh, which are rowed by internal combustion engine vehicles instead of green, uh, some green solutions. Fortunately, uh, fortunately, Ukraine survived uh, this hard winter, but these, all these stories uh, of courage uh, once again prove that the victory of, uh, uh, that the victory of Ukraine is the, is the key uh, um, to a safe, stable and ecologically clean um, Europe. Uh, Russian occupation of Ukraine reserves, destruction of animals and birds, uh, particularly uh, I can uh, mention dolphins in the Black Sea, uh, fires in the forests during the active hostilities and the uh, uh, destruction of crops by Russian shelling, such loses uh, may seem insignificant against the background of the death of uh, tens of thousands uh, of um, innocent people. Uh, and the large destruction of cities and villages. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the consequences of war on the environment are the longest and the most complicated to overcome, uh, overcome in the long term. As you know, uh, the Czech Republic is going to be engaged uh, in the recovery of the Dnipropetrovsk region. And uh, this, uh, this large industrial region is one of the most populated, especially now uh, after the people's evacuation from the um, hostilities areas. The south and east parts of the region suffer uh, from everyday Russian strikes, and the, the biggest cities of the region were um, hit as well. Uh, all the like big uh, industrial facilities were um, uh, damaged by the shelling and uh, uh, the river itself, the, the Dnipro River is uh, endangered as well. And this is just of the few environmental problems, uh, which only one region in the whole big country as Ukraine is, is uh, affected. Uh, I'm sincerely happy that uh, environmental issues are one of the long-term priorities for the Czech Republic in Ukraine, and that we do have uh, Czech organizations um, which are actively uh, active in the different regions around the whole Ukraine. Uh, our support um, to this and similar topics will uh, for sure continue, uh, also in the framework of Czech official three years program for humanitarian stabilization, reconstruction, and economic assistance uh, of Ukraine. This program was introduced. Uh, this program was introduced last year by the Czech government. Um, um, Ukraine, um, uh, Ukraine, even before the war, the Ukraine inherited um, in uh, industrial heritage uh, from the Soviet times. Um, which was causing like many environmental problems, and uh, the war became another uh, dramatic negative factor, which is uh, worsening worsening the situation even more. At the same time, 
uh, the war represents uh, the new opportunities for complete uh, redesigning and rebuilding the Ukraine economy according to the, the most modern and green standards. Uh, so uh, to conclude, it's time to join efforts um, and thus as much as possible right now uh, because uh, because uh, the moment, uh, the decisive moment, we are actually in the historical decisive moment of the of uh, that was happening. Thank you very much, and I wish uh, to the organizers and participants successful, successful and fruitful event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you too. Um... Our next speaker is Mr. Alexander Stamnichuk. He's the deputy head of the Department of Environmental Control and Methodology, head of the Environmental Control Department and at the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources of Ukraine. Mr. Stamnichuk will address, um, will present us the scale of environmental crimes caused by Russian aggression on the territory of Ukraine. Please, the floor is yours. Not sure, is he connected? Alexander? I guess there is a technical problem. Yeah, I, I'm afraid uh, Alexander is not uh, with us, so I would continue with the with the program. And uh, sure. if he will be able to join us, then uh, we will give him the opportunity to address uh, our participants. Sure, um, perfect. Uh, then we invite directly Michal Pastwinski from the Ministry of Environment of the Czech Republic. Um, I hope you are with us now. <laughs> I guess I see you. I hope uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, uh, good morning to everyone, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, especially in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank that, uh, the uh, organize, organizers for uh, not only organizing today's very important conference, but especially for their efforts and active supporting uh, Ukraine and its environment. Uh, allow me to uh, say a few words on behalf of the Ministry of Environment uh, uh, from the point of view of the view on cooperation, which is uh, has some kind of history, and I would like to briefly inform you about that. Um, the cooperation uh, between the Ministry of Environment of the Czech Republic and the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources is uh, rapidly developing and a very important milestone was the fact that uh, last year in July 2022 we have signed a memorandum of cooperation in the field of environment. Uh, our ministers uh, of both countries uh, have met several times in re recent months to discuss possibilities in areas of mutual cooperation for the future. As an example of uh, our mutual cooperation, I would like to mention, for example, a training session which we have organized for a group of experts from Ukrainian uh, ministry last year in Czech Republic. It was focused on the implementation of EU uh, industrial pollution directive uh, and the meeting with uh, our, our Ukrainian uh, counterparts uh, were held uh, within the premises of our ministry, as well as uh, in, in Senia, which is uh, some kind of Czech uh, environmental agency. Nevertheless, regarding the topic of today's uh, meeting, uh, our ministry perceives the issue related to the impact of, uh, of uh, the ongoing war conflict on uh, the environment of Ukraine as very important. We are really deeply concerned uh, about the damage uh, to the environment caused by the Rus Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we can say that the war in Ukraine uh, demonstrates that among other uh, fatal impacts for the population, uh, the Russian military operations such as, for example, the deliberate uh, targeting of industrial installations bring um, serious uh, consequences of large scale complex and long-term environmental degradation that will remain remain long after the 
hostilities have stopped. The extent and intensity of yet hidden inter environmental impacts can only be estimated at the present. However, it's already possible to say that uh, they will cause extensive uh, environmental contaminations, long-term contamination, damage uh, to terrain, ecosystem, uh, long-standing long devastation of resources directly at the conflict site. Uh, a comprehensive deep review as well as coordinated uh, remedy of the damages, damage and burdens is necessary to be done with the inclusion of Ukrainian uh, experts as well as international authorities and uh, experts from other bilateral partners of Ukraine. And bearing, bearing this in mind, uh, our ministry uh, invited uh, the Minister of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources of Ukraine Mr. Ruslan Strelets to participate in the informal uh, EU environmental ministers meeting, which was held during the Czech presidency in July last year in Prague. And uh, thus we can say that the Czech Republic was the first, uh, uh, I would say, EU, but not only EU country to, to include the environmental impact of the war in Ukraine on the agenda of the discussion among the very important stakeholders uh, from the level of, of uh, ministers of environment or representatives of government uh, of EU and accession countries. Minister Strelec had a possibility and he really briefed EU ministers on the most serious environmental impacts of the war, uh, stimulating a discussion on how to uh, remedy them and restore Ukraine's nature. Uh, all the participants at that informal EU ministers meeting agreed that on the need to systematically map and monitor the impacts of Russian aggression on Ukraine's environment. And also uh, there was a consensus uh, among all the participants and ministers that uh, any subsequent reconstruction and transformation of Ukraine should be a sustainable transformation, fully in line with the, with the principles of EU Green Deal and based on appropriate assessment uh, of, of uh, all, all possibilities and new environmental technologies. Uh, I would like to present and confirm uh, that our ministry, it means Ministry of Environment of the Czech Republic, is ready to continue and to support, to continue our support uh, to pro for the proposals of projects submitted by Czech organizations, but also international community and other institutions to be active in the field of um, damage mapping and remediation, as uh, we know that there is a considerable experience and know-how from the post-war, or, or our experts can offer uh, experience from the, for example, to, to, to just to, to provide with some example of post-war reconstruction of former Yugoslavia, or from the implementation of uh, official assistance projects implemented by the Czech Republic in some of so-called post for or former Soviet Union countries where we also dealing with some consequences of, of, of um, uh, industrial activities as well as uh, the military activities in these territories. So it means that there is a, I would say, a lot of very experienced experts also having, uh, having uh, relatively fresh uh, experience from the transition of economy. So I would say that uh, such a kind of network uh, created uh, by the NGOs, uh, academy sphere, um, Czech companies, as well as governmental institutions can provide a support and is already providing support uh, towards the, the protection and rehabilitation of Ukrainian environment. So allow me once again, thanks organizers for, for this very, I would say very important and timing conference. Uh, I'm also pleased that there is a quite high number of participants uh, uh, or participants at this conference and we wish you all the success in the to, to reach the outcomes and outputs of this conference and we all believe that we will as soon as possible we have a chance to uh, provide real assistance in the field to our Ukrainian friends. Thank you very much and all the luck, all the success with your conference. Thank you very much for your continued support and your readiness to share your experience in rebuilding the Ukraine. It's very important to us. Thank you very much for your address.
<clears throat> and I would like to welcome our next speaker. Um, uh, it's Oleg Alexey Angorets. He's a head of the NGO Green World Friends of the Earth and the expert on ecology and sustainable development. Mr. Angorets will present a review of the report Environmental Consequences of Russian War in Ukraine that was written by the NGO Green World Friends of the Earth Ukraine in collaboration with NGO Arnica as part of the international program Clean Air for Ukraine. The floor is yours, Alexei. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I will share my presentations with you. No. Yes, I think you can see it now, yes. Oh, this way. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you all of my colleagues uh, who participated with me with uh, preparing this um, investigation, this review. Uh, our team is um, mix of uh, Ukrainian and uh, Czech experts, uh, which uh, about half a year do uh, analyze uh, results of this terrible war. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank, say thanks uh, uh, part of our team who uh, nevertheless to be an ecologist and environmentalist should to be this um, with weapon should, should to be at the war and uh, who uh, combine assistance and help act in these investigations with uh, protections uh, the Ukraine. Uh, now you can see um, content uh, chapters of uh, our um, of our research. It uh, consists of six uh, chapters. And uh, in the frame of this uh, review, we try to systematize uh, damages, systematize uh, this war um, in aspect of um, influence uh, on the environmental, ecological damage. And uh, we uh, try to, uh, to do it in systematic way, uh, like uh, every part of biosphere, for example, and focusing on the exactly weapons, um, influence of weapon and uh, we also uh, include some historical aspects of uh, of uh, environmental damage of uh, different wars especially recent in 20th centuries and uh, also our review include um, a view of our Czech partners and uh, some interesting uh, uh, investigations uh, and analytics uh, concerning uh, this result uh, for this moment of this war. And uh, in final part, we are uh, try to analyze uh, our research and uh, give some uh, most important um, questions, most important discussable topics, which uh, should be uh, on the table even now, uh, up to the moment our victory, which we should to, to widely uh, discuss. Mm. Uh, first of all, uh, you can see uh, our approach, uh, our structure dividing um, uh, influence. Uh, we can divide it uh, somehow in three directions. Uh, it's uh, we, we can say about uh, direct pollutions from the use of various weapons. Uh, we can say about uh, physical destruction and damage to the environment and the uh, uh, indirect, indirect consequences, um, uh, accidents and disaster caused by military activities. And <clears throat> more detailed about this uh, uh, influences. Uh, let's start from direct pollutions from uh, from weapon reuse. Mm. Uh, we know that in uh, uh, most intensive uh, part of this war, uh, from uh, Russia have fired uh, forty uh, from forty to sixty thousand shells uh, per day, and uh, approximately about five thousand uh, from uh, Ukrainian side. So. It's a huge amount of uh, pollutions, huge amount of uh, usage, uh, mix of various chemical compounds, which uh, in results, this uh, pollute 
uh, pollute soils, pollute our environmental. Uh, we can also um, say about uh, ammunition and shells, uh, which um, have uh, specific uh, chemical, uh, some specific chemical uh, pollutants, uh, which uh, constantly uh, polluted uh, polluted our environment during um, combat activity. Uh, separately, we can say about the missiles, uh, which uh, missiles which are uh, dangerous uh, because of explosives, because of uh, uh, toxic fuel, because of uh, uh, possible combustions of electronics uh, in, in result of, of explosion. So, as a, uh, one of the another uh, dangerous um, uh, dangerous weaponry. Uh, if we continue talking about about properly uh, weaponry, uh, we should mention uh, white phosphorus, uh, which. Uh, um, used uh, often used uh, by uh, russia uh, armies and uh, which are uh, really dangerous not only uh, for for people but uh, for for environmental as well and it is a, a separate uh, uh, really dangerous um, directions of influence of on on our uh, environment uh, we uh, also should mention depleted uranium, which uh, used, which no, not a lot of people uh, know about um, such problems. Uh, it's um, it's part of uh, of weaponry. It's a part of uh, ammunition, and uh, can also lead in uh, in pollutions in our territory. Uh, we can say that it's. Lead uh, to some uh, substantial uh, radiation uh, pollutions, but anyway, it's it's also locally can be can be the problem. Uh, another uh, another part, it's uh, destroyed and abandoned equipment. You know that sh that uh, thousands of different kinds of um, um, vehicles, uh, tanks, etc., was destroyed, and it's a sort of compounds of iron and other metals, fuel and lubricants and other pollutants, which in in fact we have uh, we have uh, here. Uh, further about um, physical uh, physical impact on environmental, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, direct destruction of damage ecosystems. Uh, we can talk about uh, mechanical disruption of the ground surfaces, uh, destruction of damaged hydrotechnical structures, uh, destructions and burning of buildings and in industrial facilities. Uh, so it's all um, this character of this war lead to uh, really devastating uh, consequences for territory uh, where combat uh, it is, but also for territories all of Ukraine where we um, has a regular uh, shelling, rocket shelling and uh, other ammunition uh, shelling. So um, uh, all uh, territory of Ukraine, in fact, uh, covered uh, by uh, such, um, um, such uh, problems for people and the uh, environment. Uh, Destructions of housing stock also, uh, which lead uh, a large, uh, large amount of uh, uh, waste leaks from communications network, like a water supply, drainage, gas supply. And uh, additionally, we can uh, say it uh, as, a, as, as example, we can talk about uh, disruption of sewage treatment plants. It's a kind of indirect consequences caused by combat activities. Uh, as example, we can see that it's um, not only physical destructions of uh, of uh, these facilities, uh, filtration things, etc. It's uh, because of damage of the electrical network. It's um, of uh, uh, of uh, of electricity and cannot uh, work properly. And uh, another. Um, 
additional problems. It's uh, problems with uh, reagent supply, which cannot uh, do uh, proper um, treatment uh, treatment of uh, such uh, such water. And uh, we can uh, we should also uh, talk about shortage of specialists. Uh, a lot of people uh, leave Ukraine. A lot of um, cannot be uh, work um, further, and it's also one of the consequences of, uh, of this war as well. Uh, uh, damage for the energy infrastructure uh, can also lead to various consequences. Mm, one of the um, massive and uh, Huge results, which we know, it's uh, mm, uh, four million uh, chicken, uh, which died at the poultry farm uh, in the village of Chernobyevka due to the problem with energy supply. Uh, on the beginning of this war, it was uh, mm, uh, supplied was uh, broken energy supply, and uh, this uh, amount of, uh, of of chickens. Uh, was just uh, just died and it's uh, really ecological uh, catastrophe in um, uh, in these circumstances. It's only one example, uh, maybe more bright, but uh, a lot of another such kind of examples also uh, we was uh, uh, we was a witness. Uh, we can also as uh, as a indirect consequence, we can uh, talk about increase of air emissions caused by the use of gasoline or diesel generators of various capacities. We can also talk about increased emissions from burning woods and pellets uh, in solid fuel boilers, uh, which are um, uh, used for home heating. Because this uh, winters, uh, we uh, managed to, to survive but it's uh, a way of usage, uh, this kind of, of eating also um, was additional problem for, for us. Uh, among indirect, uh, indirect consequences, uh, we can also mention uh, internal migrations. Uh, up to 8 million people will uh, move, somebody move inside the Ukraine. Uh, somebody leave Ukraine, and uh, we uh, can take about uh, additional uh, this displacement uh, of such a large number of people uh, lead to uh, increase uh, pressure of water supply, uh, increasing volume of household waste, etc. So it's not maybe uh, so um, uh, clear and maybe so obvious, but it's also one of the Mm, uh, problems, uh, indirect problems uh, caused by uh, by this this war. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we should also talk about uh, uh, one of the mm, one of the most terrible uh, results of, of this war. It's the uh, practically total destruction of uh, human settlements. Uh, on this slide, you can uh, you can see uh, Mariupol. Uh, you know that uh, in result of uh, uh, Russia aggressions, uh, in result of this war, uh, this city practically was totally destroyed. And uh, if to uh, try to summarize uh, such kind of um, influence on uh, on settlements of city you can talk about uh, total physical destructions of building structure critical infrastructure uh, contamination of the territory with industrial and uh, household waste uh, uh, sewage and etc uh, it's a humanitarian disaster for the residents uh, we was witness of of, um, of it and uh, increase the risk of uh, spreading uh, infections here are some uh, some more terrible photos of, uh, of Mariupol. And unfortunately, I can say that Mariupol is a bright example, but uh, not only. Uh, practically all uh, cities and all towns which are uh, on the uh, front line or near, uh, they are uh, distracted totally up to ground, uh, destroyed by the Russia invaders. A uh, few words about uh, another part of our review. It's a review of uh, environmental damage and history of wars and mechanism of international uh, reparations. Uh, 
Uh, first uh, mentions about uh, about environmental aspects of war we can uh, find even uh, in Bible. Uh, and uh, nowadays uh, there are international legal norms for warfare, um, rules which should uh, be strictly observed by the parties of the conflict. And nevertheless, in uh, in nowadays uh, we had quite quite problematic, quite big envi environmental disasters caused by the war. And uh, one of them, it's a second uh, in the China war. Uh, according uh, in result of this war, approximately 30% of the territory of South Vietnam was affected. About 80% uh, of the mangrove forest uh, was uh, almost completely died. And uh, more than 60% of the trees uh, also died. Um, uh, and actually, uh, this war led to uh, to necessary to more strict follow the uh, the rules even in in war time, and uh, um, it uh, led uh, also later uh, to 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 creation mechanisms of uh, of compensations and following uh, rules. In 1991, the United Nations Compensation Commission was established as a subsidiary organ of the United Nations Security Council to process claims and pay compensation for loss and damages suffered as a result. Uh, it was, uh, in fact, as a answer of uh, Iraq's invasions of occupation in Kuwait, and later it uh, it's worked like a like a international international mechanisms. Uh, here you can see uh, another part of our review. It's uh, informations. We are giving information about uh, uh, legal ways of determining and calculation the damage um, which uh, uh, do our um, Ukraine to our country. And here you can see a structure of uh, created operational headquarters, which are responsible for uh, for uh, determining and calculation such damage. Um, it uh, was established uh, very uh, soon uh, after beginning invasions and uh, do it, uh, continue to do it, continue to uh, fix uh, these damages. Uh, here you can see example of uh, Ekaza Groza site page. It's a, um, a dashboard with information in, uh, about um, consequences of Russia aggressions and uh, uh, inform people and given uh, give a view of uh, results uh, of environmental environmental damages and uh, uh, at the end of our research we are try um, try to talk about uh, a next step and try to talk about a necessary uh to recover recover ukraine after our victory and to more crucial um more crucial more important topic among them which we uh according to our view should be on the table it's uh, uh, first of all uh, about environment it's necessary of comprehensive assessment of the state of environment after the end of the war it's necessary development of plans of restorations the natural state of damaged territories and of course it's a, a necessary decontaminations of contaminated uh, soils if the side say about economy uh, in our point of view uh, it should be uh, um, deconstructions of the remains of the post-Soviet industry. Uh, we uh, need to search for a new economic model for the Ukraine. And we also need and, uh, one of the necessary steps. It's the development of a new directions according to the model of post-industrial economy for, for Ukraine. Uh, as a more most important maybe part of economy and part of uh, post-war uh, recovery, it's uh, energy. Uh, we should talk about modernization of the energy system, taking into account the lesson of this war. Uh, we need decentralization of community energy supply based of uh, renewable energy, first of all, first of all, renewable, renewable energy sources. And uh, we need uh, wide discussions uh, concerning the uh, role of uh, nuclear and coal energy in future energy production system of Ukraine, because as, uh, as ecologists, we are, of course, uh, not would like uh, to um, 
coming back to this kind of, uh, of energy. And it should be a uh, real big, uh, big discussions and uh, understanding how we should uh, keep uh, necessary to rebuild, necessary to have uh, energy, but it should be it should be green energy, it should be renewable energy, first of all. I'm sorry for and interrupting, but we really need to conclude this part of the presentation. Can you um, conclude in like 30 seconds, please? Yeah, I only have uh, two, two, two sentences. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, urban development. Urban development, it's also, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, that a lot of our cities uh, distracted, in fact. And um, uh, urban development, according to uh, modern uh, approaches, modern uh, urbanism should be and should uh, into account uh, uh, lessons of this war. And environmental monitoring uh, should take an additional function in this situation of determining dangerous substances in the air, water, soil, and radiation also, uh, and became also a component of civil defense. And the very uh, end, I uh, also would like to stress attention of the uh, unfortunately, the main result of this war globally, it's a global militarization. Uh, global militarization anyway will be consequences and will affect not only Ukraine. Uh, it's uh, lead to necessity to uh, have uh, more weapons, uh, more armies. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately for us, it's uh, serious, serious challenges for uh, all humanity in conditions of uh, existing climate uh, and some global prob problems for the biosphere. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, you for, for listening. Thank you all of uh, our team, not only co-authors, co uh, also uh, our um, experts and all who help to um, do this uh, work and with these investigations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, for the publication and for your research. Indeed, continuous monitoring and documentation of the environmental crimes is super important to show the magnitude of the atrocities caused by Russia and consequently for claiming the reparations. Um, and now we turn to our next speaker, Mr. Miroslav Havernik, uh, who is the director of the Czech Environmental um, Information Agency. Mr. Havernik will present a view of the war from the Czech perspective. Mr. Havernik, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Um, uh, give me a second. I'll try to share my screen. It's challenging in this setup. Somehow it now you see your uh, now now you see this presentation and if i do this can you see uh, can i get please uh, uh, voiced feedback what what do you see currently i think you are sharing your full screen you need to switch to the presentation okay so you not you, you are not seeing my presentation not yet. OK. Uh, OK, let's try this. Yes, perfect. Now it's better. Uh, good uh, morning, good after, uh, good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Miroslav Havranek. I'm a director of Czech Environmental Information Agency. Just a quick uh, few words about us. We are part of the Ministry of Environment Ecosystem of Organization. Our role is uh, primarily focused uh, in um, data about environment and interpretation of this data in a way, as I would call information. Um, just from the very early beginning of the war, uh, we start to prepare uh, some information that is pre pretty much our job about what environmental consequences the war have and will have and uh, i'm really glad that uh, this group uh, move uh, uh, a little bit further and produced a comprehensive report with uh, cooperation with ukraine colleagues 
Uh, we've prepared several seminars on this issue in our country, and we are active in this area on uh, international stage. I will talk about it a bit uh, later in my presentation. Uh, I participated on the assessment because uh, this war that is happening, this horrible war, has a very unique uh, quality that um, that has not been here before. This is the first war that is uh, online. Uh, Gulf War uh, in Iraq and a bit of a Syria. Gulf War in Iraq was a uh, war that was on TV. War in Syria was partially on the internet, on online, but not in a way that Ukraine war is. And uh, as uh, much as horrible it is, uh, it gives us opportunity to see what's really happening through various sources through open sources and uh, open data sources. At the very beginning of my presentation, I would like to make a statement that there is no such thing as environmentally friendly war. War is immensely destructive uh, uh, thing that, uh, of course, is focusing on destruction of uh, enemy, but uh, according to the destruction, uh, altogether with destruction of enemy goes also destruction of environment. So um, as soon as the war started, I mean, it started 2014, but as soon as this hot part of the war started, it was clearly as they uh, uh, visible that this will have immense impact on environment and indeed immense impact on environment it has. Uh, the intensity of the war is uh, in a way that we haven't seen from, I would say, from Second World War, but maybe uh, hot parts of Korean conflict in uh, in the 60s, uh, 50, uh, 1950, 1952, 1954, uh, are comparable in terms of um, consumption and destruction of uh, of explosives. Uh, I've done a simple analysis uh, through open sources, um, for example, how much uh, Russians are claiming that they are consuming artillery munition, how much uh, West countries are supplying Ukraine, how much uh, ammunition Ukraine is claiming is using. And uh, what is clear is that the energy flow of uh, destructive power that is embedded in the shells and ammunition is that actually there is an energy flow in a size of Hiroshima sized nuclear bomb approximately twice a month and it's uh, it's visible the pictures that are coming from from your country from Ukraine are comparable on this uh, screen you can see actually on the left side uh, this is the reminder of Hiroshima on the right side this is the how Marinka uh, looks right now and uh, it's pretty much same bleak picture. So uh, the physical destruction of the environment cannot be understated, not only build up environment, but it also goes to the uh, to the other other uh, areas I will talk about. Uh, I use data from uh, Russia will pay project from uh, Kiev uh, University of Economy. Uh, that they are uh, constantly monitoring and updating databases of uh, of uh, destruction, and again the destruction of the build-up environment is immense. It's incomparable with anything we have seen since uh, Second World War. There are cities, uh, city-level destruction happening in the in the Ukraine, and data shows it. Um, this, of course, brings challenge immense challenge of uh, and sorry I did not put it uh, uh, from the very beginning I'm talking about environmental damage uh, but I also recognize that there is an immense humanitarian uh, level of this war I will not talk about because it's not my specialty and uh, I think that we are focusing on environmental side but just to be clear that we are well aware of uh, of uh, such uh, of such thing uh, when we uh, started to accept refugees uh, we accept uh, family uh, we have ukrainian family in in our uh, second uh, second home we 
my grandma left it and the stories that they uh, they are telling they are quite quite horrible so we are quite aware of um, of uh, humanitarian consequences of the war but talking only about environment so uh, the waste production uh, and waste management systems that uh, were not in great shape before the war let's be frank about it are now under immense immense stress and if we talk about reconstruction one has to perceive that uh, the reconstruction will not be possible from pristine material because uh, then it the reconstruction would take decades or maybe uh, uh, several decades uh, to to do which is not time that is feasible so uh, one has to see this part of the, the destruction as also a uh, part that will supply materials for the for the reconstruction uh, this is just a picture how uh, we see the ukraine uh, for example from our satellite data before the war and now how uh, this exact scene looks after after liberation uh, by russian federation so uh, the destruction is simply uh, undescribable and it uh, brings the pressure to uh, the environment that we are now uh, currently facing i know that talking about climate change the thing that is happening but the worst impact will come in decades uh, is a bit rich uh, because your country is under pressure uh, where your destruction can come next month so i understand that it's not prime concern but for example if we only look on cost of destruction and possible reconstruction the uh, of course reconstruction and rebuilding will require burden uh, climate with another emissions because all the materials need to be created or recreated uh, the construction will have to be built and so far what we see uh, on the destruction side of the uh, of the war again it's immense uh, only if we take the data about uh, proven destroyed uh, housings and all other uh, areas uh, that uh, that ukraine is mapping we are now accounting like five to eight years of whole our country production of uh, greenhouse gases emission and this is just the emission embedded in the in the um, in the production of steel concrete and um, and asphalt and of course there is uh, another uh, climate burden associated with all other activities uh, site zaragoza has been mentioned already that uh, the destruction uh, of the equipment is also burdening the climate uh, to be frank uh, compared to other uh, flows this is very minor i would say even though it seems it's not it is because uh, the biggest uh, threat uh, uh, to climate from this war comes from two major sources first is uh, the destruction and reconstruction of build up environment and second is uh, burning up forests this is the picture from uh, Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus is a European satellite constellation monitoring environment. And uh, this is how your average burnt area uh, looked like, the blue line, um, in past decade or two. And this is how burnt area looked like in 2022, the first year of, uh, of war. And as you see, the growth has been uh like two level uh two degree of magnitude increase of burned up area and of course this burned up area releases substantial substantial amount of uh of carbon that would be otherwise fixed in in forest environment and this is another picture also from copernicus the increase of uh, forest fire number of forest fire and as you see this uh, dry spring and spring offensive uh peaked immensely amount of forest fire in ukraine so this is uh, again a uh, very destructive uh, endeavor not only on uh, on level of uh, for example biodiversity and uh, physical destruction but this is also burdening the climate that is uh, already under immense stress 
and to give a perspective how uh, how the data from uh, from summer looks like uh, in eastern Ukraine, the forest fires in eastern Ukraine. And um, I put into perspective because in our country, in Czech Republic, we have uh, immense forest fire in our one national park. And it was, well, I would say, a few square kilometers of burned wood uh, that uh, brought up um, national amazement and, of course, uh, um, uh, national, uh, uh, let's say, uh, people were uh, not amazed. Amazed is not a good word, but we were scared. So, so this this uh, this forest fire is huge and it's terrible and stuff like this. And I put the picture here, uh, you know, just to add a perspective how it looks like from from a satellite view. So uh, the perspective is important to have when we're talking about uh, level of destruction. What we do also other other things uh, because my predecessor, my uh, colleague that spoke before me, uh, pretty much summed up um, uh, our thinking about, uh, about various aspects of destruction. But uh, I would uh, not underestimate one aspect that is quite important, and this is international cooperation. Uh, because this war severed uh, some things that were quite established, mainly uh, due to uh, Russia um, unwillingness to uh, follow them up so we lost several meteorological station in the in the russia we lost data flows uh, about uh, about the various environmental aspects the, that were sub, uh, generally supported by russia uh, the environmental infrastructure that is providing data is uh, quite often under under attack uh, in this war so um, uh, this uh, destruction of international cooperation again will take decades uh, to to repair if uh, if it ever will work and uh, we are trying to actively help uh, ukraine with assessing of environmental damage i'm personally part of the global environmental outlook committee and uh, we've managed to put into following report, uh, GEO7 report, that the impacts of conflicts will be explicitly mentioned and assessed in the new GEO7 report. Uh, GEO is Global Environmental Outlook. And small, uh, small cherry on top that Russia will not lead uh, as it was uh, before the war, Eastern Europe group of authors, which is also quite uh, good. Uh, we also starting, I'm um, uh, calling you actually from uh, IPA network meeting. IPA network is uh, a network of directors of European directors of environmental agencies. And uh, in about an hour, we would uh, establish the uh, interest group on environmental war impacts in Ukraine. Not in interest group in a way that we are really interested in those impacts, but rather that we are um, trying to organize uh, some help uh, in our capacities, in capacities of environmental agencies to Ukraine in terms of training, data sharing. Uh, you are now accession country, so uh, you should have access to all uh, various uh, funds and uh, supporting tools that supports uh, accession countries uh, in the process uh, to European Union. And again, it might be useful for Ukraine to have a partners uh, here in Europe uh, to, to guide you through or to help you. We already contacted uh, your Ministry of Environment. I believe some people are here. We con we've been contacted from, uh, from uh, Ukrainian parliament. Uh, so uh, there is another uh, level of cooperation in environmental domain uh, that is happening right now. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to present my short view on uh, on this horrible war. Mm -hmm. This is actually a picture that I received from one of our Ukrainian employees because after world uh, after war, a uh, uh, bunch of uh, oh, bunch uh, about half a million of refugees came to our country, and we try to employ them as much as possible. So, in for example, in our agency, we are employing Ukrainian refugees. And uh, the guy came to me with this picture and said, this is picture from Bucha from uh, uh, the, during the summer, just to showing uh, uh, how uh, we are caring about our environment. 
so this is quite contrast of course uh, men uh, loaning his uh, yard and uh, destruction of the houses in the background so this is uh, something that always uh, keeps me interesting interesting so thank you very much and uh, um if you have any question now is the time Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, um, thank you very much for your continued support. And as you have mentioned, international cooperation is indeed the key for assessing the environmental damage and planning for the recovery and rebuilding of Ukraine. As mentioned before, the questions are welcome in the uh, chat section. So otherwise also in the uh, questions and answer session uh, in the end of the conference. Now we uh, would like to turn to our next speaker, um, Pablo Hazan. He is Lieutenant Colonel and serving in the Ukrainian, sorry, and a serving Ukrainian army officer, a veteran of Russian war in Ukraine since 2014. He's also a developer of civil and military engineering systems and an expert on ecology and renewable energy. Lieutenant Colonel Hazan will talk to us about uh, the environmental aspects of the Russian war in Ukraine. Please welcome, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you and may begin uh, my report uh, from words of Timothy Snyder. In his uh, brilliant book called On Tyranny, Professor Snyder says, if none of us is prepared to die for freedom, then all of us will die under tyranny. And um, this is very interesting idea. It's very simple, but at the same time, uh, this is very real, this is realistic. And this is what we have now in my country, in Ukraine. We are talking now about the war. And this is a war, not just a conflict, in East Ukraine, like uh, some uh, journalist reported uh, nine years ago. This is nine year and one month war uh, with the Russian invasion. And this war began in February, 2014. And um, I believe that Russian war in Ukraine is a milestone of, uh, of the history of Europe. It's not uh, very simple because now Ukrainian soldiers, men and women, gave their lives for freedom and democracy in the world, in Europe and in the world. And uh, we still don't know exactly how many civilians, including children, was killed by Russian terrorists in this war. And um, it is very important that this is not just a Putin's war in Ukraine. This is war of Russians. This is war of Russian citizens. And all Russian citizens responsible for all killed children, civilians, soldiers in Ukraine. And this is very important to understand. And uh, this is also very important to talk about consequences of the war and how we will manage um, all this data after the war. Every day since uh, 2014, the whole world once again saw the true face of terrorist state Russia that is killing people. And uh, this is not only on battlefield. This is also in peaceful cities. It is of course, very difficult to maybe to understand. Uh, it's, uh, it's necessary uh, maybe to feel. It's uh, of course, uh, maybe very difficult if, if somebody's seen this uh, on TV screens or, or uh, notebooks monitors. But um, it's, it's covered, it's, it's through bloody and criminal essence and goals with talk about this peace of this country. And um, this is only proves that the uh, liberation of uh, our entire lands, uh, Ukrainian lands, uh, is only foundation of peace and secure of all Ukrainians. Um, and um, of course, it's uh, many aspects of this war, many, many aspects. It's humanitarian, it's military, 
uh, and also our environmental aspects. It's uh, of course, maybe not the, the, the first aspect that uh, everybody talking about on different levels uh, on, the, on, the, on the international level, European level, as well as it's not maybe very much uh, uh, important now for the soldiers, which is now in trenches on the, on the zero line fighting for Europe's freedom and for world democracy. But at the same time, <clears throat> it's also a very important aspect because uh, our environment, this is uh, our home. Uh, this is uh, the uh, environment where, where we, are, we, we are living now and where we will live uh, in the future. So it's a really big pleasure to be co-author of the one of the first investigation on environmental consequences of the war. And I personally very much appreciate to my dear colleagues for collaboration in this work. First of all, to Alexei, who, well, and who was an energizer of this work and did a lot to, to collect everybody because it was it was really very difficult. Two of us, Max and myself, uh, we've been and we we, we still uh, in the army uh, on the front line, and um, it was not very easy to uh, to uh, manage all this team to to do this work. I very much appreciate to Max who is a senior private of, uh, of the armed forces of Ukraine for, for a couple of years serving uh, in, in Ukrainian army. I very much appreciate to Marcella, a well-known environmentalist in Czech Republic and a very big pleasure to be a co-author with you, as well as with Katerina, who is associate professor and Miroslav, of course. Uh, and um, of course, very much appreciate to all Czech and Ukrainian colleagues who helped and supported of this investigation. And I believe that uh, this investigation uh, will be uh, our good input to a wider investigation of uh, the other groups and the, the, the wider investigation on the consequences of this war who is which is done now and uh, i believe will continue then in collaboration with other groups what were the, the questions of this investigation first of all how does military equipment and uh, military ammunition and military equipment engage the environment environment it, it, it means that, that, that everything, we, we know that it's, it's million of, of ammunition from bullets of, of rifle and, and guns and machine guns and up to, to artillery ammunition and, uh, and big missiles. This is grenades, uh, uh, missiles, rockets and, and other ammunition. It's fuel and, uh, and many, many different kinds of uh, uh, very, very toxic materials. The next question was, uh, how do military actions influence the environment of Ukraine in terms of specific future features of each of fallen components? It means air pollution and climate change. It means oceans, seas, rivers, and lakes, soils and impact on agriculture, ecosystem, and biodiversity in general as, as a global impact and as a global consequences. And of course, as a human settlements and industrial complexes. Another question was, has the environment been damaged as a result of the war? And uh, was, was mechanism uh, available to provide reparations for such damage as a compensation? It, it will be, of course, in the next investigation will be much more statistics on which the uh, our lawyers, which are actively working now, and big very much appreciate all Ukrainian and uh, foreign lawyers who are working now on these issues, and they will take in, into account all these statistics to uh, do to, to complaints to the courts 
against Russia and against Russian citizens. Another question was what, uh, what, what measures in the government talking to register the damage influenced by the actions of Russian Federation. And this is also important to include it different investigation as well as continuing monitoring what we have in, in Dnipro region and in other regions of Ukraine. And not only in Ukraine, because all these consequences, as you've seen, uh, also damage to other countries as well. Another question was what conclusions can be drawn, can be drawn, uh, and what forecast can be made about the negative impact of the war on the environment in the medium as well as on the long term. This is very important because we know that the uh, consequences from Chernobyl or Fukushima uh, we are monitoring uh, now and we will monitor, uh, I think, in, in many, many years in future. And what are the most important issues to be discussed after the end of the war? to mitigate the environmental impact and to how we, it, it, it was the, the, the post war the newer cities and the economy with the ecological standards and the principle of sustainable development. All this question we did describe, we did our best to answer all these questions. Nevertheless, this is the first investigation we did uh, on the base of uh, uh, some of our researches, uh, I mean the field researches and the samples we analyzed. Nevertheless, uh, I do believe that we will continue and uh, uh, very much appreciate to all colleagues uh, involved in, in this investigation, but we will continue. And I believe that we will collaborate with uh, other groups because it will be enough room, enough space for all groups and all institution investigate uh, the environmental consequences of Ukraine. Ukraine has very big territory. And unfortunately, the damage what Russians did in Ukraine, it's really unbelievable. It's, it's of course necessary to calculate, it's necessary to evaluate, but uh, of course it is impossible to evaluate and calculate uh, deaths and uh, lives what Russians in Ukraine. And um, of course, uh, we will continue monitoring. We will continue uh, the gathering of uh, statistic data from, from different countries. And uh, uh, we will continue monitoring because our main aim, we, we're still fighting. We're still fighting on the front line, on the battlefield. This is still fighting on the uh, legal front line in the international courts. We're fighting on the international negotiation and uh, helps with, with, with big support of uh, our colleagues and friends from different countries. And um, in the end of my speech, uh, I would like to say with the words of William Shakespeare. And uh, Shakespeare's Ulysses speaks to Achilles saying, one touch of nature makes the wall word kin. And um, this is very, very old, uh, very old play of Shakespeare, but nevertheless, it's very actual now because we are feeling the support of all the world, that all the world understand what this word means. Uh, I would like to thank a lot uh, to my good friend, uh, Rebecca Harms, uh, which uh, start to talk about danger of Russia even be before the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war in 2014. And many of my colleagues and friends uh, who told about the image of Russia and now even, unfortunately, even now, uh, the world understood what Russia is, what Russians is, and that this is the war, the war not just against Ukraine, this is the war against democracy, against the, the world system, world order. And I do believe that uh, we will win. Uh, 
uh, with support of uh, all our friends. Uh, and uh, this is the different kind of support. This is military support, this ammunition and equipment for our soldiers who are destroying and killing Russian invaders. This is big support on social level for our cities with generators and medicine and uh, different equipment to support our cities, uh, cities and our citizens. And only uh, together we can win and only together uh, the whole world can, as Shakespeare said. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much um, to you uh, for your service and also for the insights provided and also for introducing our next speaker, which is very nice. So turning to the future, we would like to welcome Ms. Rebecca Harms, the former member of the European Parliament, who will talk to us about the ecological challenges of the recovery ahead of uh, us. Please unmute your microphone. Sorry, I, I thought you did it. <laughs> so first of all, um, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. Um, thanks uh, a lot also for waiting a bit for me. I was late, I have to excuse myself. I'm responsible for a visitors group, um, farmers um, and uh, people who are teaching. Um, so farming, different farming activities from Vinica and from Bar. And there were some transport issues today in my region, and I had to solve those transport regions, uh, the, those transport uh, issues in the region first. But now I'm here, and um, I I must say um, I think uh, that um, the work uh, done uh, by Pablo Olexi and all the colleagues uh, Pablo has mentioned. Um, is a very, very important uh, work, a kind of um, a very necessary pillar uh, for what we are discussing about recovery uh, of Ukraine. And um, after I read uh, some of the chapters of the report, I did not manage to read uh, every chapters in detail, but after I read it, um, I found it also a proof uh, for what Ukrainians are today, uh, because I think it's uh, the proof of a tremendous strength yeah? while uh, fighting still uh, the war against Russia, already preparing uh, to win the future uh, for Ukraine um, and to win uh, so on this front line uh, of um, environmental uh, damages. Um, I think um, that um, this um, is another battle yeah, which Ukraine, after winning against Russia, has to win yeah, to be really able uh, to, um, to guarantee to its citizens what those Ukrainian citizens deserve uh, after this horrid period. What um, I understand uh, from the report is maybe going a bit um, deeper or is reality based uh, because since 2014, I visited again and again uh, the Donbas region, the front lines, and uh, with the locals, I tried to explore uh, already before 2022 and February 2022, uh, what kind of damages had already been uh, there uh, based on direct uh, military battles uh, or uh, based on, for example, the lack uh, of uh, pumping the water uh, from the coal mines uh, in the Donetsk region. What we understood about uh, the environmental damages, so uh, damages for especially water and soil, um, was um, so compared to what we see now, not a huge problem, but it was already a huge problem and a huge challenge. Yeah, So it's a growing challenge, the environmental challenge uh, for Ukraine, air, water, land, whole ecosystems, settlements, cities, 
uh, industrial complexes are um, are affected and are also sources. Yeah, industrial complexes, um, power plants, transformers are sources of the environmental um, impact uh, of this war. Um, I think that um, based on this report, we can, um, as also international community, especially also in the European Union, uh, we can start to understand the very different sources of the pollution and also the magnitude uh, of uh, the pollution uh, we will face. Um, and I, as a politician, I would leave it to the experts uh, to understand the different challenges uh, for human health and the environment. Um, uh, but um, I think uh, what uh, in politics we have to understand uh, that um, we have to prepare ourselves to heal the damages. And this is not an easy task. So first of all, I think that um, as well as in Kiev, also in Brussels, um, it has to be understood uh, that reacting to these challenges must be part uh, of um, so uh, preparations for the big recovery plans uh, for Ukrainian future. The debates about uh, the recovery must include uh, all the different uh, chapters which are uh, covered by the report and uh, all these different uh, damages and impacts described uh, for the environment. And information, as uh, Pablo mentioned it, uh, information is key. Uh, and the European Union should help Ukrainians to gain a systematic overview um, and to keep um, this overview always up to date. And before any major reconstruction or resettlement activities take place, so resettlement uh, for um, for uh, cities uh, or towns, or also resettlement uh, of uh, industrial uh, complexes um, take place, these pollution issues have to be understood so that um, from the very beginning, we can avoid to invest in places uh, where we will face uh, big challenges uh, after resettlement activities and after uh, investment took place. Uh, I have some experience with uh, the clean up and resettlement uh, activities after Chernobyl. And I can tell you major mistakes happened during these processes and we should, we should really avoid it uh, after we and Ukrainians could win, will have, can win uh, against Russia. Um, what um, I would um, like uh, to um, say in the very end, I think we need an overview, a systematic overview, what kind of um, processes or technologies um, exist for what kind of um, so damages we are facing in Ukraine. Um, well, well um, so having in mind, while having in mind uh, that uh, this kind of destruction in a country has not happened uh, in a similar way, maybe outside of Syria, but Syria is a different country. So there might be problems uh, for which we have not yet an idea how to deal with it, uh, but this has to be decided. I think um, we also need, um, so besides the systematic overview, uh, so on over the damages and over technologies or methods uh, to work against it and to, um, to organize cleanups, we need um, a list of priorities. So what has to be done first, second, et cetera. And this all should always be part of the debates uh, on recovery uh, plans uh, for, for Ukraine. Uh, so information from my point of view is uh, key. 
Uh, and uh, in addition, I would also advise uh, the uh, Europeans and those and the Ukrainians um, and those who are responsible uh, for different parts of the recovery plans, um, education will be very necessary. So people need good skills uh, to cope uh, with the challenges um, caused uh, so for environment uh, by this war. Let me um, end uh, with um, uh, so uh, also a personal wish, um, especially so since I uh, know Pavlo and uh, many other uh, soldiers um, as good friends uh, since many, many decades. Um, I'm uh, very, uh, very proud to know you. <laughs> I'm proud um, that uh, you are such a strong um, uh, country that you are representing such a strong country. And um, I liked that uh, in the report, you had also a chapter on reparation. I think um, after uh, now the international uh, court uh, opened a first case uh, against uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, so we should also try to um, make these crimes against the environment um, and against uh, the future of Ukraine a part of uh, the international process uh, to end uh, Russian impunity. Thanks a lot uh, to everybody who uh, worked on the report. Thanks a lot uh, to the colleagues in Czech Republic who uh, supported uh, this report. And I hope uh, we will get impact uh, in the recovery process. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's, um, yeah, it's always a pleasure to work with you. And uh, thank you very much for your continued support and involvement uh, in Ukraine. Indeed, the support of the international community would be essential in rebuilding and building the, map the mapping plans for recovery and resettlement. So uh, we are looking forward to working together on those <laughs> plans. <clears throat> and uh, now we are turning to our next speaker. Uh, it's one of the co-authors as well of this research, Marcela Chernohova. She's the coordinator of the Czech-Ukrainian long-term campaign Clean Air for Ukraine, implemented by the Czech NGO Arnica. Uh, Ms. Chernohova will talk to us about the challenges of the proper inventory and analysis of the contaminated sites based on the experience from the Czech Republic. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning from the Czech Republic, though I think in Kiev it's now good afternoon. Uh, I will try now to share uh, share the screen, That's which is always challenging. So let's hope that uh, it will work. So hopefully, yes. Uh, so uh, again, thank you for being with us. And uh, I would like to share with you the experience which we in the Czech Republic uh, had and still have with uh, the inventory and also with remediation of the contaminated sites. Uh, as Anna mentioned, I work for the campaign Clean Air for Ukraine. So I would like to very, very shortly introduce uh, ourselves. Uh, as it was said, it's a long-term program. We have been active in Ukraine since uh, 2017. And uh, it's a joint work of uh, Czech non-governmental organization, Arnica, uh, non-governmental organization from Ivano Frankivsk, Free Art Uno, Eco City, and uh, the organization from Dnipro Green World, Friends of, uh, of Earth. Uh, since very beginning, we focus on the air quality, mainly in the industrial regions. Uh, but uh, when the war started, uh, we added uh, another another issue, another topic, uh, which is the environmental damages uh, caused by war. Uh, you can see the link for for our web page where you can see uh, all the information what we do and about our activities. But uh, very very briefly uh, about the air quality part. Um, I would say that the, the core of, of this, uh, this area is the development and um, operating of the Civic Air Monitoring uh, Network, EcoCity. 
again, uh, you can see the, the, the link. Uh, and uh, also uh, our colleague, uh, Oleksy Trelevsky, he is present with us and uh, he will share all of these, these links and also his uh, contact. So if you will have any questions about the uh, air monitoring network, uh, about uh, these uh, activities, please you can directly contact uh, him. At this moment, we have around 220 stations of the EcoCity uh, network, but uh, there are like quite big number of uh, stations of other operators which are integrated in, in one map, which is uh, online and anybody can access it. With the war, we had another challenge and we decided that we will develop new type of station, which has uh, also the radiation sensor. And we set up a target for us for this year that we want to make sure that in each region there will be at least four stations uh, with, the, with the radiation sensor. And we also developed a notification system on Telegram chatbot, which is called Radiation and Smoke Alarm. Uh, any of you can uh, look into it. You can subscribe uh, one or several stations. And in case that uh, there will be change of air quality, you will receive a notification. So that was about the air quality. And now back to the topic uh, which this conference is about, and that's about environmental damages. Um, you heard already from Alexei and Pavlo about the report which we together prepared uh, in the last uh, year. But this is not uh, the end of our work. We certainly want to continue focus on this, on this area, on this uh, issue. And uh, the plan is uh, for this year to carry out uh, four case studies. Uh, we focus on uh, Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporizhian region because these are two priority regions which we have been active since, uh, since the very beginning in 2017. Uh, the plan is to do sampling analysis, but also uh, to take it a little bit further and use the experience from the Czech experts and suggest the methodology for uh, remediation or for cleaning uh, these sites and maybe also make an example of the budget, how much uh, that uh, that would be, which then it can be used by the uh, local and regional authorities when, when planning uh, the remediation plans for the recovery process. But uh, also, uh, I would say that Czech Republic has a long experience in mapping and evidence of the contaminated sites and also with the remediation. And in the long term, uh, we have big plan on transfer of the know-how. Uh, and now I would like to explain why I think that this know-how could be uh, useful for, uh, for, for, for Ukraine. Uh, the Czech Republic uh, has and had two types of uh, contamination. One was uh, done by Soviet army in the military areas. And uh, then the other type of contamination was by the economic activities during the communist uh, regime. And after the revolution in 1989, uh, uh, there was the decision that we have to make an evidence uh, database of the sites. And why? Uh, because for any investment projects and privat privatization, uh, it was important for the investor that uh, uh, they knew on which site they are working. It was some kind of investment incentive because they received the remediation guarantee. So it meant that in case that they would found uh, some unpleasant surprise on the site where they are going to invest their money, the state, the government uh, guarantees that uh, it will cover the problem. And then of course, uh, there is the accession process to European Union, which was one of the preconditions if we wanted to be part of European Union that we will establish a system of evidence of the contaminated uh, sites. So just brief summary, uh, what we did and uh, how it was done. Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, the Soviet army occupied, uh, occupied the Czech, Czech, Czechoslovakia then for several decades and they were uh, occupying 73 military areas, which uh, after the evaluation, 60 of them were considered as significant environmental damage. Altogether, it covered 155 sites. Each of them received a special passport, which uh, categorized them and categorized the type of uh, contamination. The major of that contamination was, of course, soil and groundwater. 
uh, by petroleum hydrocarbons, so fluorinated hydrocarbons, polyfluorinated biphenyls, and heavy metals. And uh, overall, the remediation, only these 73 or let's say 60 uh, areas cost uh, at that time uh, more than one and a half billion of Czech crowns. Uh, so uh, you can see that even in this small scale, it was uh, uh, quite a tremendous amount uh, of money. And we can use this experience to transfer to you. But then there was even another much more uh, like sophisticated and uh, comprehensive uh, project, which was about uh, evidence of contaminated areas uh, in, in, in general, covering, covering the whole Czech Republic. It was done in two phases. Uh, the name is uh, National Inventory of uh, Contaminated Sites. And the first part uh, started in 2009, uh, and it focused on development of uh, methodology, which uh, put together the public administration records, which were scattered in different, uh, different places. But uh, it was also using uh, remote sensing methods, like historical orthophoto maps and satellite data and uh, questioning of local and regional institute, institutions. After developing this method, the methodology was uh, verified. It's three tested areas. You can see it uh, on the picture at squares uh, 50 by 50 kilometers. So that was the first part. And then when we had the methodology in 2018, uh, it was decided that uh, the uh, national uh, mapping will be carried out. Uh, altogether, uh, more than 30,000 sites were uh, evaluated or verified, uh, and uh, then uh, basically at the first phase, they divided into two groups. One group, uh, it was they were excluded because uh, it was decided that they are not, it's not needed to, to be further evaluated or checked. It was more than 21,000 sites. And then there was the second group, uh, which were after the first level of evaluation considered as contaminated or potentially contaminated, more than 10,000 sites. Then there was uh, carried out investigation in the field by teams of researchers. And uh, at the end, the result was that uh, in total, 446 sites were uh, considered or uh, classified as that there is a remediation required or recommended. Uh, now I would like to say uh, why I think that, again, what are the similarities between the Czech Republic and, uh, and Ukraine? Uh, first, we also had uh, military sites. Uh, then uh, we also went through some kind of historical contamination, same for, for, for Ukraine. We also went through some kind of recovery process. It wasn't after war, but after communism. And uh, we also experienced the process of uh, accession to European Union or entering European Union. So therefore, our plan, our vision is that uh, we will try to transfer the know-how of this, uh, this methodology. Uh, we will uh, try to adjust it and test according to the Ukrainian situation. And just to stress why, I think it is important even in this situation for Ukraine to deal also with the historical contamination and not only by the uh, by the war damages because in the recovery process i think it's it's a matter of uh, safety for people when they work at sites for investors uh, it can be also incentive uh, for the potential investors maybe it will be a requirement of the potential investors that they would like to know uh, if they are investing in the safe site or uh, what uh, what could be the problem there? And uh, as it has been mentioned here several times, uh, Ukraine it's now uh, in the accession process, and uh, by the European Union legislation, uh, this will be required. So I suggest uh, once we are dealing with the issue of contamination, it would be good to cover both uh, both of, both of the the elements, not to have to then uh, lose the time and come back uh, to this to this issue. And now very last few, few, few words. Uh, I think there is so much damage which was done to the environment in, in, in Ukraine that uh, it's impossible for one organization or even one state, uh, one institution to cope with this, with this issue. There are many organizations, many institutions which are now uh, working on this issue. And I would really uh, 
call or appeal. Let's cooperate. Uh, the resources are limited considering uh, the level of the damage. And uh, I think uh, we should use this synergy, try to coordinate, not to overlap, not to uh, do duplicity. So uh, we are ready, we are ready to, to work. We are open for exchanging the information. And uh, I hope that uh, together uh, we will help Ukraine to, to win. We will win together. And then uh, together we will help the Ukraine to recover uh, from, from this uh, terrible, terrible damage. So uh, thank you, thank you all. And razom do peremohi. Thank you. Um, indeed, as you mentioned, there are so many similarities between our countries that um, your experience is super valuable for us and your presentation already looks like a draft roadmap for what we have to do. So thank you very much for your continued support and care for Ukraine and Ukrainians. And I would like to turn to our next speaker. It's Ms. Maud Sarli from the EU Advisory Mission in Ukraine, who will provide us with the insights into challenges and opportunities of the investigation and prosecution of the environmental impact of the conflict. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone, and Marcella. I just want to uh, make one tiny little edit. I'm not with the EU advisory mission, but with the Pravo Justice, which is also an EU project and part of this you know, network of um, international um, assistance that's been developed to uh, help Ukraine in these difficult times. <laughs> I also want to apologize for my voice. Um, I explained to Marcella that I unfortunately uh, am under the weather. So <laughs> if you don't um, understand or if I get uh, caught by some uh, cough fits, <laughs> please apologize, uh, excuse me. Um, so I've been asked to tell you about the challenges and opportunities of investigating and prosecuting the environmental impact of uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, there's going to be a lot of connections with what uh, each one of you um, have already talked about, um, and I'm hoping to um, build bridges between uh, our respective expertise. The first question is why it is important, why is it so important to investigate and prosecute the environmental impact of the conflict? Well. The right, everyone should get access to um, clean water, edible food, breathable air, and that's aside from um, the damages caused to ecosystems, etc. So each of, of, of these rights, what I call rights, the right to clean water, edible food, breathable air, are, are hugely impacted in times of conflict, like uh, has, it has been um, demonstrated in, in the previous um, speeches. Um, and in Ukraine, it has already had a huge impact. Now, why uh, doesn't tell us why these types of crimes or the disenvironmental impact of the conflict should be investigated and prosecuted? Um, so I see three key reasons for that. The first one is protection, a protection of the Ukrainian people, of Ukrainians' public health. The second one is prevention, and the third one is accountability. Um, so protection first. When you investigate, you actually contribute to identifying the nature and the extent of the environmental damages, which is a first step towards fixing them, towards reparation, towards restoration, which has already been discussed. Um, it's also a first step towards figuring out solutions to um, addressing the public health issues that result. And that's actually in line with the um, uh, president, with the peace plan, the 10 point peace plan that President Zelensky um, um, proposed, uh, which includes uh, nuclear safety, food and energy security, environmental and environment protection through the restoration of water treatment and the demining of uh, farmland. So investigating and prosecuting is really important for the protection of public health and of Ukrainian people. 
Um, now, it's also very important for prevention because through prosecution, um, you contribute to um, creating a deterrent effect. Um, sorry, oh, sorry. You contribute to creating a deterrent effect. And, and that's also another um, key aspect of President Zelensky's um, 10 point peace plan. Um, what's interesting is that the Office of the Prosecutor General has actually identified the um, investigation of the environmental damages caused by the conflict as one of its priorities. As you probably already know, um, there is an entire section um, of the OPG, of the Office of the Prosecutor General, dedicated to the investigation and prosecution of ecocide and environmental related crimes. Um, and yet these crimes, these types, this particular category of crimes, um, are the least litigated in um, before international or domestic uh, courts, which which makes me um, hmm, move on to the the, the third um, reason why it's so important to investigate and prosecute them, aside from the protection of the Ukrainian people and um, the issue of prevention, is for accountability's sake. Um, because ultimately, the the um, the purpose of the investigation is to hold those most responsible accountable. And now that's where the challenges come when you get into the details of an investigation and and holding those most responsible accountable. Because you need to first collect the evidence, which in times of conflict is particularly challenging. Um, it is also challenging in times of peace, but in times of conflict, it adds another uh, layer of challenge. Occupied territories are inaccessible, uh, even when they're accessible. There's a lot of you know, uh, safety and danger issues when you're under constant shelling, particularly in the Dnipropetrovsk Nipro region and Zaporizhia <clears throat> at the moment, let alone the, the eastern part of the, uh, of the country, etc. Um, but collecting evidence is important to establish um, that the elements of a crime are there, that they've been um, found and that they can be demonstrated. Which leads me to um, my next <clears throat> big question and the next big challenge. Which crimes are we talking about? Um, under Ukrainian law, in the Ukrainian <coughs> sorry, criminal code, there are two main crimes, um, main articles, sorry, which um, we can focus on. The first one is Article 438 of the Ukrainian Criminal Code, um, which refers to violation of rules of warfare recognized by international instruments. And the second one is Article 441, which refers to ecocide and incriminates ecocide. Now, with the first one, war crimes, basically impacting the environment, um, well, many different challenges, and I won't get into the details. I will just give you an overview um, because there's a wide range of possibilities. Um, it, it calls um, into th this particular article, the 438, calls into Ukrainian law the, the, the wide range of, of, of possibilities that um, international humanitarian law offers. Um, the most relevant provisions um, would be the provisions of the Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Convention, and two are uh, specifically um, referring to the natural environment. Um, Article 33, uh, 35.3 of the Additional Protocol 1 and Article 55 of Additional Protocol 1. They roughly um, deal with, um, again, a similar type of issue. I can read you Article 35.3, which um, says that it has prohibited to employ methods or means of warfare, which are intended or may be expected to cause widespread, long-term and severe damage to the natural environment. Article 55 is um, worded in a, in, in a similar way, but as the first uh, provision that's directly applicable to um, environmental damage in the context of a conflict. Um, and so that's what the, the Ukrainian criminal 
code allows us to use for prosecuting this type of damages. The second one is ecocide, and it's defined under um, Ukrainian law. And sorry, it's a translation that I found because I sadly don't speak Ukrainian yet. Um, it reads, um, mass destruction of flora and fauna, poisoning of air and water resources, and also any other actions that may cause an environmental disaster. So that's the other possibility to go for when you're investigating and prosecuting this um, environmental impact of the conflict. You either go for the war crimes um, category and these two direct provisions of additional protocol one of the Geneva Conventions um, through the prism of uh, the Ukrainian Criminal Code, Article 438, or you go for ECOCIDE 441. Now, there's a number of subsequent <coughs> sorry challenges <clears throat> attached to the interpretation of these provisions um and that's that that takes us back to the fact that they're hardly ever litigated and when they when provisions are not litigated when crimes are not litigated or prosecuted there's no way it's very difficult to figure out how the elements are to be interpreted because there's no case law now what's common for these two categories of crimes the war crimes um impacting the environment and ecocide is that the consequences must be established as severe long term and widespread um it again no specific case law but a few examples some of which have been mentioned in the previous presentations um the vietnam war um hasn't no prosecution have been uh, conducted further to the uh, widespread severe long term damages caused by the um vietnam war and the americans um use of certain uh, means of warfare. Before that, during World War II, so we had the reference to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the use of the nuclear um, weapon. But uh, interestingly, there have been also some uh, case law in the context of the Nuremberg trial trials um, related to the police, poli the poli sorry, the um, policies of scorched earth applied by the Nazi troops when they were withdrawing from Finland, Norway or Poland, there was a scorched earth policy that resulted in the destruction of um, the environment and forests uh, up north in Finland and Norway, but also in Poland. Um, and there's like one or two paragraphs is in one of the judgments which actually uh, recognize that as a, a crime, a war crime. Um, but aside from Vietnam, um, the Second World War, you also have Iraq, which um, again, no prosecution, investigations only to the extent that the assessment of the reparations had to be um, done. Um, another example, uh, include also the bombing um, of Kosovo uh, by NATO in 1999. But again, nothing specifically investigated, no case law to assist us in identifying um, how to interpret the um, requirements that it has to be severe, how severe, long term, how long, widespread, how widespread. Um, and aside for, from these two provisions that I've been talking about so far, the ecocide um, provision of the Ukrainian Criminal Code and the, the um, uh, additional Protocol 1 provisions, which can be called into Ukrainian law through Article 438, you also have another um, series of crimes that could be used um, with a bit of creative interpretation, pillage, destruction of property and anything um, associated to the illegal exploitation of natural, natural resources, which can be particularly relevant for occupied territories, for example. Um, but again, and you have more case law for these categories of crimes of pillage um, and destruction of property. Um, 
but 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 um, it still raises a number of of huge challenges. The biggest of which, because we were talking about um, just establishing the reality of the damages, but then you also have to establish who's most responsible. So the, and who had the intent of destroying the environment, which is a huge um, import, a hugely important requirement uh, in uh, criminal law. Um, and and when it comes to establishing the intent, who do you go for? Do you go for one particular individual? At which level um, do you go for the state responsibility? Do you do it collectively? When it comes to international criminal law or to national criminal law, you don't go for state responsibility. But even if you have a specific individual um, in mind, you have to establish the chain of command, what type of responsibility applies, as it's been illustrated by the very recent arrest warrant that was uh, issued by the International Criminal Court Office of the, the persecutor of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, on Friday uh, for deportation of Ukrainian children. Um, so, yeah, in a nutshell, a lot of challenges as, uh, uh, um, associated to the uh, context. Uh, it's the conflict is still ongoing. The territories are not necessarily ac accessible. The um, required techniques or the required logistics are also very difficult to implement. Uh, so the investigations have to overcome a number of different obstacles. It's also um, Im impacting the entire uh, territory, which is huge. Uh, so this, the, the scope is immense. So investi investigating such a huge geographical scope is a big challenge. Um, challenges as attached also to the law, which has never really been interpreted um, before. So there's no precedent. Um, but but with the incredible um, determination and willpower of the Ukrainian prosecutors, the Ukrainian investigators, which, as it turns out, is in line also with the political priorities set out um, in President Zelensky's peace plan, I strongly believe, and I think I'm not the only one, that the conditions are gathered um, to... Um, to, to, to push towards the creation of this precedent and 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 to help through this you know terrible conflict that shouldn't have happened um to create an opportunity for lack of a better word to adapt the law um to the environmental uh, and climate crisis that um Ukraine but also the world um is is uh going through at the moment um so yes to finish on a very uh positive and hopeful note um i've noticed directly that determination and i strongly um believe that this conflict is potentially going to be historic in the precedent um it will help set in international and um national law when it comes to the environmental impact of the conflict thank you Thank you very much for your um, fantastic overview of the legal um, provisions that have to be followed. Indeed, the collection of the evidence is the key in, in the investigation. So, um, yeah, we hope that Ukraine will be the leader in proving or establishing as many echo sites as, as, as needed to prove the fault of the Russian responsible people. Um, and we turn uh, to our last speaker, but um, uh, not the least, uh, who is Simona Bochkova. And she will talk to us about the effects of the war on air pollution in Ukraine that is based on the satellite data. And she's representing the world from space. I hope I'm not making a mistake this time. <laughs> So welcome, the floor is yours, Simona. Hello, everybody. I will try to share my presentation first. Um, hope you can see it. Yes? Yes, so, yeah. So I'm Simona Bochkova from the company Work for Space. And first, I'd like to thank that uh, you invited us to present our study 
Uh, so today I will talk about effects of uh, the war on air pollution in Ukraine. It will be measured from space. Uh, uh, first, I will introduce the, the company and ask what we are doing a little bit. Then I will uh, tell you something about what was the study focused on and what methodology we use to measure the impact and uh, what are case findings and results. And also I, I will share some limits of the study, which we found out. So first, something about us. Uh, we are uh, a technology company. Uh, we have an expertise in our observation and environmental sciences uh, in providing processed and uh, interpreted satellite data, mostly from Sentinels, uh, Landsat, but also some from private uh, companies and private source of satellite data. And we also cover a wide range of areas from remote sensing of the earth itself uh, to smart agriculture or uh, application for cities, uh, environmental monitoring, but also uh, analyzing air quality. And uh, what's interesting, in 2021, we, we conducted a study that was uh, focused on analyzing air pollution in Ukraine and identifying uh, key polluters. It was focused on overall situation, impact of industry and population, and also there was a focus on COVID-19, what were changes in pollution during this time. So what is the methodology we used? Uh, we were using uh, basic data-driven analysis. Uh, and uh, we were focused only on one pollutant, nitrogen dioxide, and we use uh, Sentinel satellite, uh, uh, satellite Sentinel 5P data, which measure gases in specific wavelengths since a 2018. And uh, this uh, satellite has uh, now uh, uh, 3.5 to 5.5 kilometers uh, temporal resolution. And uh, and it has like uh, everyday, uh, sorry, special resolution is 3.5 to 5.5 and temporal resolution is like every day, but uh, there's a limit in data in case of clouds or some quality value filtering. So you should have data every day, but uh, uh, in reality, it's not from every day when it's very cloudy, you can't have data for weeks, for example. And uh, at the base, the study was focused on comparison of pre-war and war period. We were looking for increase in nitrogen dioxide volumes in connection with the shelling of Ukrainian cities. It was like short term, uh, daily base. And uh, on the other side, uh, we were looking for relation between the population and the uh, nitrogen dioxide concentration. This was like long term analyzed. Uh, that's why, why we choose nitrogen dioxide. Uh, uh, the pollutant is characterized by a high degree of correlation with uh, anthropogenic activities, and the war is uh, anthropogenic activity. And the um, but in general, like main sources of this pollutant are uh, can be transport, heating, uh, power plants, uh, coal power plants. But during the war, it's mostly some military activities um, uh, uh, linked with uh, industrial activities for military and also transport of troops, suppliers, and also destruction of the infrastructure. So what are key results from us? Uh, we found out a uh, reduction of nitrogen dioxide concentration on almost uh, entire territory of Ukraine. And we found out relation between uh, changes in this pollutant and the population of some area. But uh, uh, we didn't find like no long-term increase of nitrogen dioxide concentration measured by this satellite it was found for sites associated with a uh, single explosions on the infrastructure due to the war activities. And this is the, because there are two opposing uh, processes in destroying cities. When there is uh, less people due to migration 
and to less economic activity in the area, it leads to decrease uh, of the pollution. But in the same time, there can be increase of pollution due to explosion. But we were not able to detect it uh, in the data in short term. And the long term measurement uh, uh, show like decrease of, of the pollu pollutant because it was uh, people left the displaces and this uh, decrease was higher than increase. Mm. I also have some maps. Uh, uh, in this uh, slide, we can see uh, long term per pixel analysis. On the left side, there is a pre-war period uh, from 2018 until 2021. And the period is uh, in months. It's since the beginning of the war, so February. And it's until November. And on the right side, uh, there is the same period, but only for 2022. And we can see reduction of the nitrogen dioxide concentration in almost all Ukraine. And the largest decrease in absolute values was recorded in Eastern Oblast, uh, around large agglomeration of Kharkov, Luhansk, Donetsk, Dnipropetrovsk, Zaporizhia, and also for Kiev city. And uh, in average, the decrease was around 9.4% for the whole country. And uh, here is a map showing. Uh, relative difference of data from previous slides. Uh, we've highlighted uh, areas where change has occurred. Uh, the largest degree over 30% is observable in or, or, or around cities uh, such as Kiev, Kriri, or Zaporozhia, as you can see. But also there are two highlighted spots in Donetsk region. And uh, both of them are uh, like linked with almost 100 depopulated places due to war. It should be like Bakhmut or around the Slovians. And also you can see a uh, very really high decrease of pollution in Mariupol. And uh, when we look on some uh, graph, uh, this is a graph from uh, zonal statistics and uh, it's uh, calculated to regions. So you can see that for most of the regions, the, there is a decrease of pollution. And um, yeah, here is an example of the effect of some selected uh, uh, individual explosions on changes of nitrogen dioxide concentration. It's compared with uh, it's compared with average value in the pre-war and war period. Uh, you can see that mostly there is no change or reduction. And um, there was an increase in some in two investigated locations. But uh, for these days, when we looked on the on the data, data from these days, uh, there were uh, like increase in several places in uh, Ukrainian without uh, obvious connections. Like uh, the whole monitoring for these days was increased in every place. So as I said before, that uh, Sentinel 5P data may not be insufficient for assessment uh, of individual days. Uh, and here uh, in this map and graph, uh, the relation between changes in nitrogen dioxide pollution and uh, the population can be seen. Uh, it can be observed that the large share of IDPs, so, uh, which means like internal displaced people person, uh, comes from eastern macro region of Ukraine. And in the same time, the, in time, the largest uh, relative share of decrease in pollution can be observ observed in this eastern macro region also. And also Kiev city, uh, but uh, Kiev represents a specific uh, macro region uh, since its area is limited only to the capital, like the uh, area of capital. And we can also see that the Western macro regions achieve low reduction of this concentration while also having uh, fewest leaving IDPs, both in relative and absolute numbers. And uh, 
So what were limits of this study? Uh, so as I said, we were uh, we were focused on nitrogen dioxide, and uh, it has a high accuracy and data validity in regards of anthropogenic activities. Uh, but the quality data may not be uh, enough for assessment of individual days because uh, some nature of factors or high cloud cover or some filtering of data. But on long term. On the other hand, there is a decrease of nitrogen dioxide in many places, uh, but it's important to see the decline in context because these places has uh, no long-term source of pollution, uh, which has been uh, which has been stopped because people had to let their homes, and also in this place, its infrastructure has been destroyed, and there's no more industry or um, some other sources of economic activity. So it's not caused by implementation of some better technology uh, the source of pollution, but it's caused by, by the war and by the destruction of a thousand lives and another million affected. So there is decline, but uh, yeah, what, what is the reason? And uh, also, I have some recommendations uh, what we could focus on on other analyses. Uh, Simona, I'm very sorry for interrupting. Could you please conclude in like half a minute, a minute, if possible, because we are running out of time. Yeah, yeah. it's just last slide. So, yeah, so uh, it is possible to compare specific uh, periods when people left and returned to their homes, like decrease in pollution versus return to economic activity and increase of pollution. Or we can use uh, some CAMS data, which are data from Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. It can be uh, PM10 or PM.5.5. Uh, or uh, um, as Minister, Mr. Havranek mentioned in previous slides, uh, we can focus on uh, monitoring fires and their environmental impact because there are multiple sources of uh, this data with uh, different attributes. It has higher temporal resolution and also spatial resolution. And uh, some data sets can provide uh, data on air pollution from fires, uh, such as uh, um, carbon dioxide, so uh, sulfur dioxide, or some nitrogen fluxes. All of them can be monitored from fires. So uh, this is everything from me. And uh, if you have any question, you can contact me on this mail. Thank you. Thank you very much for your detailed presentation of how the monitoring can be presented to people. Super useful. Um, thank you very much once again. Um, so we are at the final stage of our conference, which is the key questions and answers. And unfortunately, I didn't do a very good job at keeping all the speakers in check. So we only have 12 minutes less left, but all the presentations were super, super important and, and very, very interesting to hear. So I think it was a good time spent. So I invite the participants to raise their hands in, um, in Zoom just to indicate whether they want to raise any questions. Um, and if not, I've already seen that there was quite a um, quite a an active lively discussion in the chat. So participants are already interacting with the speakers, which is great. Um, so we are really happy and I hope the organizers are happy that they've uh, sparked such uh, an interesting debate with, uh, with the public. So I'm just checking if there is anyone who has raised their hands. I don't see so far. So um, I'm just going to um, ask the speakers to see if um, if they would like to share or reflect on the uh, whether or not the character of the environmental impact has changed since uh, the beginning of this year. So after the research that was presented uh, in the beginning of this conference uh, has been finalized. So um, 
please. And I see now that Maxim Baradin uh, has raised his uh, hand, so maybe I will allow him uh, an intervention, and then I will uh, allow the speakers to come in in a round of reflections. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I have a, I have a special question uh, about uh, the pro the practices of other countries uh, for the solution after the uh, World War II, with uh, one of the most uh, question uh, important uh, as I see is the question of uh, pollution of soil. Because uh, when the uh, war action uh, um, stops, uh, the air pollution is a uh, question which is lower than uh, soil pollution. And the soil pollution is uh, takes uh, with it the question of uh, water pollution. So the, as, as I see it, uh, the base uh, question is soil pollution and what uh, Ukraine can use after the deoccupation, de um, what practices for the soil renovation? Uh, what practices? As I know, there there are some practices that use in green plants uh, to um, extract uh, heavy metals uh, or some chemical uh, um, um, solutions from the soil. So uh, I know that uh, after the World War II, uh, Europe has. Uh, uh, great impacts uh, with these problems. Uh, so I think uh, they already have uh, some uh, techniques, uh, already have some uh, solution uh, for the situation. And if uh, or organizers have some materials on this same or uh, some uh, presentation or investigation, I um, hope uh, you help us to find uh, these materials because I now work uh, for the uh, specific region for the Mariupol, um, uh, doing uh, a report about uh, um, what war uh, do to the Mariupol and what we need to do after the deoccupation. De so uh, um, uh, um, especially need these uh, materials to make this report uh, is uh, very useful. Thanks. Thank you very much for your question. Who would like I, to... I, can, I can reply if I might. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the question. It's interesting that you're working on Mariupol. This is my my first my first city of the war in June 2014. I came to sector M and from the sector M my war started. Uh, first of all, uh, I believe it will be interesting for you to read our report. And yes, you are quite right that the first of all is soil and water. And also don't remember that it will be the very, very long and complicated process of the mining because uh, we have many lands hardly mined. And this is another question. This is not just only environmental environmental problem, but this is the uh, the big uh, question of infrastructure of the mining. It will be it will spend a lot of resources and equipment and, and, and money to, to do it. And in combining with the mining, we will also have a lot of problems of uh, this contaminated soil and pollution of water and also uh, we don't know exactly uh, about uh, the uh, contamination of uh, radioactive materials it's it's this work should be uh, started on, on but uh, it, it will of course uh, uh, we will need to uh, to have all our territories under control of Ukraine to 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 talk about all the all the things thank you Maybe maybe I can add uh, also a few things uh, from the from the Czech Republic. Uh, first of all, the plan is when we will do the case studies in Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporizhia, uh, that part of that will be uh, the suggestion of the uh, the best methodology for remediation of the site. So that will be one uh, one one part as well. Uh, your specific request about using the the, the plants. 
uh, I'm not aware of this publication. However, I can ask. So uh, if you if you want, I will ask him on the uh, on our network about the, uh, the the experts who are dealing with this. And I will uh, if I will find anything like this, I will I will certainly uh, forward it, this to you. I will share it with you, Maxim. Yes. Thank you very much to your question. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Rebecca, please. I only wanted uh, to warn uh, that uh, people think uh, after the Second World War, all the problems, all the challenges have been solved in a good way. So um, I can tell you for Germany and also for other parts of Europe uh, that there uh, were not only long-term um, problems, uh, but also um, solutions which created new problems. So as I said, too fast reconstruction uh, processes um, increased problems uh, for, um, for health, for example, in Germany. Uh, so what I said, um, I, I think I meant it very seriously. So first of all, um, a good cataster of all the problems have to be uh, produced. And then um, you have to decide um, about priorities also depending on technical or other uh, possibilities uh, to, um, to, to, uh, for the cleanup. And there, there will be problems um, for which you won't have a solution. Uh, so one example is, for example, in Germany, we have um, still polluted um, territories. And they are nowadays, for example, used for activities uh, like um, so installation of huge solar parks. Yeah? So uh, no um, agricultural activities possible, but we find other activities which fit to the polluted uh, soil. But it's, it, it's a difficult uh, process ahead. And um, I think the more we know about the pollution, the more and the better we can avoid uh, mistakes, uh, which will create uh, burdens for future generations. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, anyone else wants to reflect? Um, uh, does Sergei want to speak? Because I'm not sure. No? Okay, it seems that um, all the questions that were there now have been already addressed. We would like to um, invite everybody who would still have follow-up questions after the conference uh, to write them directly via email to uh, Clean Air for Ukraine or to all the other um, publishers or co-authors of the report. And um, yeah, we would like to thank you very much for your participation. We would like to thank you very much once again to the speakers who have found, um, well, for their support to Ukraine and for um, joining us today. Um, Marcella, please. Yes, uh, I would like to also say that uh, we will try to collect all the presentations from the speakers and we will share it with, uh, with the participants. Also, that you will be able to see the uh, recording of our of this conference on our website and our YouTube ch channel. And I also would like to thank to all speakers, to the moderators. Thank you for the for the hard uh, hard work, and uh, also to all of you for being uh, being with us. Because I think it is important that uh, we will work together and uh, we will win together. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this conference. And hereby I close it on time. Thank you very, very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for the very good moderation, Anna. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Bye bye all. Thank you and thank have you a everybody. nice day for everybody. Do pobaczenia. Good luck to the front line. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.